And was the man healed? When you see the emotions that are going through Jesus when he's at the tomb of Lazarus, understand that. He felt things just like you and me. He probably felt them in a much deeper aspect than what we could ever feel or know or comprehend. So getting back to our story, Let's look at verse 43. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, what? <laughs> can, can you picture the scene? The stone is rolled away. Anybody close to the opening smelled the stench that was in there. Jesus speaks, Lazarus, come forth. All of a sudden, you start to hear a commotion inside the grave. And this guy comes out wrapped like a mummy. And Jesus says, loose him. Now, what do you think if you had the opportunity to ask Lazarus? Don't you think you would ask him, what was it like, dude? What happened? Were you in heaven? Were you? Does the Bible say anything about Lazarus' experience in those four days? Now, there was a feast that they gave. Jesus was invited. Lazarus was invited. Right? And he never says that he saw heaven. He never says that he saw a light. He went towards that light. He never said he saw his loved ones and he talked to them. It is silent. And there's a reason for that. So as I close this morning, I want to ask you some questions. There have been a series of movies in the last three years about adults, but mostly children, experiencing heaven when they die. How do you explain this? If I'm here telling you the Bible says it when you die, we sleep. Say it out. Say this. Does the devil play by a set of rules? No. So when you hear little children telling you stories of what they saw, what they experienced, they saw their grandparents in heaven talk to them and came back with, with uh, things that they told them that they would never possibly know. How do you explain that? Number one, the devil doesn't play by any set of rules and he will use whatever he can to deceive you. Now listen, you need to understand this because we are told that as you get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, the miracles of Satan are going to be so great that if it were possible, it would deceive who? Even the very elect. What's one of the greatest deceptions that the devil is going to use to deceive the world at the second coming of Christ? It is going to be the state of the dead. I had a pastor who was my mentor. His wife died after the funeral service and he went back to his house and he was so tired that he sat in his chair and he fell asleep. He felt a hand on his shoulder and he looked up and there was his wife. That was their routine. He would fall asleep in the chair and she would come touch his shoulder and speak to him. And after he came home from funeral service, did the same thing. Now this man, he was the ministerial secretary for the Florida Conference. He was a pastor from probably, I think he was in his 30s. And at that point, he was in his late 80s. He had lived and preached the truth for a long time. And the devil still came to him with deception. And he opened his eyes and his wife started talking to him. And it was her voice. And in that fog of just waking up, he didn't know what was going on. But when he came to his senses and realized, he called out the name of Jesus and she disappeared. The devil does not care about you. The devil is not your friend. And he's not here to help you. He's here to destroy you. 
And you need to understand that. That he will use whatever means he can to deceive you so that you suffer the same fate he will suffer. Your only hope is understanding the very word of God and knowing what it says. How do you explain that most of the Christian churches believe that when you die, you don't really die? That was a rhetorical question. Anybody got any ideas on that one? Deception? This is why you also need to know church history. Why are you guys called Protestants? Have any idea? What are you protesting? The, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul as it's come into the church, do you know where it got its start from? It got its start from Catholicism. They didn't originate it, but when it has come to a teaching of the church, find its start there. And in the Protestant Reformation, when they were given all of these biblical truths, they continued to cling on to this one error. And it has come to this, it's still being preached to this day. What do you do with text that says, absent from the body, present with the Lord? Any ideas? Number one, you need to read the scripture because that is a misquote. There is a whole lot of verses when Paul is writing that text. So, does the Bible contradict itself? No. Right. Are there hard things in the Bible to understand? Yes. There are over 2,500 texts from Genesis to Revelation about the state of the dead. 2,500. There's only a handful that speak that may give you the idea that when you die, you continue to live. Okay? There's a whole lot more. So what you got to do is you got to read the whole context of Scripture on that subject. Right? But in the end, if you go right back to Genesis, God said that when you die, you will what? Die. The devil said, when you die, you will not die. Who was telling the truth? And that's where you start from. And I'll go into more of this next week, because we'll start going into other texts. Okay? At some point, you're going to go to a funeral. You're going to have family members or friends who believe that when you die, your loved ones in heaven... Um, I've never, I've never actually been to a funeral where they preach that person was in hell. <laughs> I've been to a lot. I mean, that's funny. I've known a lot of people that what that preacher was saying was not the truth because that person definitely is not up there. <laughs> this is going to be one of the greatest deceptions that's going to get more and more prevalent as we get closer to the time of Christ's return. You have to know the truth of what the scripture says about death. Because Satan will try to deceive you. What do you do if you wake up and one of your dead loved ones is sitting on the end of your bed? Have you ever, has anybody here ever seen a ghost? Look around. I've seen something. Okay? And I've experienced some really strange things. What is it? From the scripture, I know that it is a deception from the devil. Does that include dreams? Yes. Because I dream all the time. Yes. I'll end with this. Before I became... Before I became a real Christian, I'd always believed in God, in Jesus as the Son of God. I just didn't live what I was taught. I was going to, uh, I was studying martial arts, and I was studying martial arts for, man, at that point, probably 11, 12 years. 
And martial arts and the Eastern religion go hand in hand. You can't separate the two. Okay. So I was also going to uh, uh, psychic classes. Didn't really believe in psychics. Um, but I've met, because my instructor's wife was a psychic, and she had a lot of friends that were psychics and uh, channelers, and I've seen some things that you just couldn't explain. Uh, and the first day I walked into this class, the first thing this lady said is, I can see you're a seeker after truth, and then she started telling me, God uses us to show people the truth. And then she started saying, I just don't understand why Christians think that what we're doing is wrong. She goes, I help people. And at that point, I was searching for God. Okay, and I was searching for truth. And I was going to pretty much every Protestant church, mainline Protestant church. I was raised a Catholic. And so I was able to see that they were far away from the scriptures. Uh, so, like I said, going to that, that spoke to volumes to me of what she said. It showed me that Satan is alive and well and will do whatever he can to deceive you and keep you in his grasp. Okay? Um, my instructor, who I've known him since third grade, he really, really fell into that teaching to this day still holds to those beliefs and that ideology. I stopped going to that and I joined the Adventist Church. And I got to see clearly the truth as it is in God's Word. And I was able to see the deception and how great that deception is. And I personally got to witness the miraculous power that Satan has to show signs and wonders keep you in his grasp. But I found one greater. One greater than Satan. One who is able to break through any deception that he has. And all he asks from you is that you submit to him. That you learn of him by studying his word. And when you learn of him, you learn of his love, you get to realize there's no one else I would rather worship. There's no one else I would rather submit to. There's no one else I would rather trust more with my soul than Jesus Christ. Amen. Closing hymn is hymn number 524. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise, and just to know us.
sisters, so let's bow our heads as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to speak to your people today. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath that you've given us. Father, what I pray is that you will strengthen each of us individually, that you will strengthen our faith, that you will help us to study your word, that we will understand and know the perils that face us ahead, that we will be able to discern truth from error, that we will see the deceptions of Satan and know that we can cling and trust in you. Father, I pray that you will use us as your people to proclaim the three angels' message to this world, that the work may be finished and Jesus will come back. Father, bless us, use us, and change us. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name.